Hello, and welcome to whatever this is going to become. Uh, it's currently two in the morning, and I am now planning to lock myself in this church building for the next couple of hours to figure out the answer to a question I've had. Uh, what's going on? That's the question I have. What's going on in the culture? What's going on in the country? What's going on in the church? And I haven't had much time to think about it because life is exhausting, but I do have a few hours to give this. So I'm going to go in here, lock the door, and I'm just going to try to think through this and see as much as I can and be as honest as I can with you who are watching this. Uh, I hope that this uh, gives you something to chew on. And uh, th there'll be some discussion questions at the end of each video. So you could like watch it with a friend or watch it on your own and chew on it. There's all sorts. I'm, I'm going a little long now. Uh, I'm just going to get to it. Uh, thank you. And I, I hope you enjoy. Thanks for your attention. If we're going to have an honest conversation about church, we're going to have to talk about the church's history. And that's going to make everyone uncomfortable in different ways. Like some people, some people love the church. They think that the church is the single hope of the world. They think the church is the body of Christ manifested on earth. And so for them, it can sometimes be difficult to acknowledge that whatever body it is, it's done some pretty awful things. The sexual abuse and cover-up in the Catholic Church is truly evil things. Trying to fiddle in politics and raise money and make power plays, just gross and kind of dirty game playing. Now, never mind residential schools and all the other realities. And sometimes it's hard to know like how much corruption is appropriate in our institutions. <laughs> You know, hear me out. There's corruption in every institution, and some of that we recognize is just the, the, the consequence of scale. And the older something is and the bigger it is, the more likely there will be some horrendous things. But does that discount the whole? And if we're going to look at the whole, we've got to look at all the good that the church did. Because the church has done its fair share of good. You know, I'm no historian, but I think a lot of these universities and colleges were started by churches. And a lot of our social care, our structures, our communities were formed around congregational life. And so the church did a lot of good, not just bad. And today we have new institutions. All the old ones are pretty much gone, you know, rest in peace to the Lions Club. But there's still some, some church around, but there's these new institutions. And, you know, they're bringing in a lot of resources. They're bringing in a lot of money, more than their fair tithe. And yet, despite that, I don't see them doing a lot of societal good. You know, what's their responsibility as the new church. When I drive around, I often see hospitals, and their name is Saint Blank. Saint Mary, Saint Joseph, Saint John, Mark, and Judy, you know, Saint, Saint, Saints. Because they were all started by the church. But I've been driving around for a long time, and I have yet to see even one 
I Hospital. Did you know that not so long ago, it was required, it was required by law that the highest point in any neighborhood would be a church steeple? Isn't that interesting? So if you were living at this time in a village or a neighborhood, every day you'd be walking around, waving, saying hi, getting groceries, and every time you looked up, you'd just see, boom, the church steeple, like your whole life just being oriented every day around that symbol of oppression. <laughs> no, no, of course, no, the church is, it, it, I mean, maybe to you, you know, to educated people like us today, you know, we, we understand the modern world, we know how to play Minecraft, but the, for those primitive people back then, those simpletons who only knew how to grow food and care for their, each other and build communities that sustain for literally over a thousand years. You know, for ancient villages, tribes, groups, they oriented their life around something that gave them purpose, meaning. And when they went to church, it wasn't like, oh, I gotta go to church because mom made me. It's the, you know, oh, now it's church time and I go into the church and here I am and everyone I love, but oh, God is present and I fall on my knees and blah, 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 you know, just existential, ha, ah, bliss of worship for them, the simple people. But that would have felt good, you know? Like that would have felt amazing. And I wonder, like, did it, did it affect them in any way? Did it cohere them? Did it bring them together in worship, in community, in service, in, in, in a collective narrative? Did it help the collective psyche to be oriented around a steeple? Because today, in my neighborhood, the tallest points are luxury condos. Which is interesting. On, on the one hand, it's like, well, we have a housing crisis. No one can find a place to live, and so the idea of putting little houses in the sky, that seems smart. The problem, though, the problem is, is with the first word, luxury. Yeah, I don't, I don't know anyone who's in the market for luxury anything. And the people I know who are worried about finding a place in my city are like, they're looking for mediocre condominiums. Where's that market? And like, what's our hope to solve the housing crisis and the people living outside without a place to sleep? You know, are we hoping that they'll go straight from a one-room tent to a two-bedroom condominium? Is that the hope? They don't have first and last month's rent. And I know this is personal for me. I will own, uh, I'm not coming after, you know, anyone in particular, all right? I understand everybody's just in a big system, and I know that everybody says the problem is with the banks, but I can't come after them because they're the next highest place in town, you know? It's just, you wonder if it affects us at all. Does it affect us, these high places at all? Are we orienting ourselves around them in any way? I, I don't know. What I do know is that Across the street from my house, there's a uh, train tracks, and then you cross over. It's this beautiful north end of Hamilton, and, and I love this neighborhood. 
uh, but there's challenges that it's facing. There's a bunch of city housing, like dozens and dozens and dozens of units, that they were going to turn into luxury condos until they hit a luxury snag, and now they're literally half demolished and uninhabited. There's a fence around what used to be housing, and across the street, across the street, are a bunch of people, dozens of people, living in tents all year round. You know, and that seems like a problem. I get why people are taking apart their faith. It absolutely makes sense to me. Uh, people have been doing it, I mean, for a, a long time, but really it feels like it's been speeding up in the last while. I mean, when I went to seminary and first became a pastor 15 years ago, People were talking like this. We were beginning to understand more, see more, know more about the world, and so we were starting to take apart the simplistic ways that we were handed faith, to shine the light of truth on things that had been covered up. You know, I understand how this is just the weirdest time to be religious Christian ever. We have the internet. The internet. All of a sudden, when I was halfway through high school, the world was like, oh, you know all those things you wanted to learn? Here's all of them. And you're just like, what? You know, all of them? All at once? That's crazy. So, of course, we were going to go through some sort of collective time of deconstruction. But I will admit that I feel a little disappointed with where it's gone. You know, people have been taking their faith apart and, and it feels like there's been a slide in their messaging. Like at first you check their social media and they're writing things like, I'm a follower of the radical way of Christ who dismantles all systems of oppression. And you're like, oh, you know, that makes sense. I can see the connection. And then one year later they're like, I'm a poly sex witch who loves tarot. Yeah. And it's like, oh, Okay, okay, nothing necessarily even wrong with that, but it's just not very Christian. You know, at a certain point, you're not deconstructing, you've just deconverted and converted to the moon or whatever, you know? People who are like, I can't pray, that's weird, but I love astrology. It's just, it's sort of a strange a strange and sort of predictable slide. Like in this capitalist environment, there's a lot of product to sell people if they take apart their faith all the way and just let it drift into whatever. And if any conservatives are listening to this and thinking like, you get them, you know, rising from your memes, <laughs> like you, you have got a lot of stuff going on as well that you should feel pretty ashamed of. You know, it's not deconstruction for you. It's more like a, just a hardening of your chest and heart, right? And a taken back. We've got to take back our country, which is not a thing you can do. You know, I think the only people who can take back this country are indigenous. You know, there's a lot of questions around, like, what do you think it means to be a Christian. Do you think it means to win? Like, that's not the way it goes. And if you, if you have, like, posters in your house or big print-offs of the face of your political leaders, the ones that you love, and you've got their name in big letters and their face on big objects, and you go and you look at them, I just want to say I don't know anything about policy, but that's idolatry. Hey, 
The big head that you all go around and look at and stare at and touch? That's idolatry. Stop being idolaters. You know, and, and, I, and there's maybe some people being like, yeah, everything sucks. It's like, oh, shut up. Like, you know, this is not good. We can't just be consuming this much information, consuming this much merchandise. We can't just take it all apart and have nothing to show for it again. Something will always take its place. I guess when all this deconstruction stuff began, I was hoping for something a little more radical. And some of you are thinking, well, that's easy for you to say. You're a pastor. And if you deconstructed, you'd have to find a new job. And to that I say, Before we go any further, I just want to make it clear that I'm performing in these videos. Uh, this is there's a performative element to what I'm doing here. I mean, I've got a, a microphone and a, and a camera. This isn't accidental. And so um, I'm performing because I think there's something that can be shared best in this medium, that there's some things I want to say, but the way that I might say something in these videos is not at all the way I would say something to a person in conversation, you know, like, like I'm not a big yeller. Uh, the, some of these things are my real opinions and they are what I currently think, uh, but the way that I might deliver them will be performative. Uh, part of the reason I wanna share that is because the medium of this is also unable to contain the real message that these videos are pointing towards, which is one that has to be embodied. The idea of church, gathering with people, embracing people, prayer, transcendence. These are just not things that you can communicate through video. And so to some degree, if you want to try out my thesis, you're just gonna have to go to church. They're open on Sundays. Uh, and, and I wanna keep doing this because the truth is I really like performance and I like people that have performed for me when they put their thoughts and ideas together into something that I can sit back and watch as a passive experience with the ability to pause or rewind or perform later something back in my thoughts and reflections on it myself. I think there's something beautiful about that. And so maybe we can just clarify the expectations that, you know, we're not friends. I don't know you. I'm just taking a shot at who you might be and what you might resonate with. And you don't know me. We're not friends unless we are friends in real life, in which case this feels more uncomfortable. But for most of us, we aren't friends and I'm not your pastor and this isn't church. But maybe this can just be what it is. <laughs>
I'm going to be honest, not being my favorite time to be a Christian. You know, we've just had numerous public scandals over the last couple of years, and increasingly as people realize that they sell well. And so there's been just no limit to, to crazy stories, like some really crazy ones, massive pastors with massive moral failings. You know, there's, I, I, actually, I don't even want to get into it because the truth is we sort of accept and expect celebrity scandals from celebrity models. You know, and the way that the church has been operated in the West has been so consumeristic and so celebrity that it's just created uh, the potential and, and almost inevitability of this sort of disaster. But it's, it's the closer hurts, the personal ones, those are the ones that really cut deep. Those are the ones that wound. You know, it's like I can expect a scandal out there, but betrayal from someone in here in my own community, someone I respected, a faith leader I looked up to, those hurts, those betrayals, those ones are the ones that, that really cut. Those are the ones that break faith with the whole, because it's like, well, if they could do that, then how could I trust anyone in this whole system? My sister's pastor recently had an affair with the church administrator and ran off. And during COVID, a mentor of mine had an affair with the church administrator and ran off. And it's like, you know, you guys are so creative. Couldn't you find some other way to blow up your life? I mean, the pastor and the church administrator at this point, it's like a little cliched, right? But I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm being mean. I should be more merciful. People are having a hard time. They'll grab onto whatever's in front of them, even if it just brings death to everyone around them, even if it hurts everyone around them. They'll do it because they're hurting also. I guess I don't want to throw the blame anywhere, necessarily, though there is some to go around. I'm still hung up on that hurt, that pain of betrayal. And maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe feeling that pain is simply the sign that you really did have faith. You really did believe such a good thing was possible and you were really willing to put yourself into it. And, and what is a thing but a collection of people hoping and praying and, and wishing it to be so until it manifests? You know, we don't need more people in the world with hardened hearts. We don't need more people in the church constantly on guard of all possible wounding. We need a way to move through the pain, to acknowledge it, to feel it, and to pass through it. But that can't happen here. I hope you can find somewhere to put that hurt, if that hurt is yours, but for what it's worth, if it's worth anything at all. I'm really sorry that happened to you.
Do you guys think they'd let us do take backs for Sunday? Like, not all of you might know this, but there used to be a time not that long ago when things shut down on Sunday. Stores closed. People went to church together. I mean, not when I was a kid. When I was a kid, lots of things shut down and people went to baseball. But even then, they weren't at work. And that seemed good that not everyone had to work every day of the week. It seemed good that we could have one day of rest together for things to just pause and cool and settle. And then at some point, they realized that they could sell me an egg timer on Sunday. And I'm so impulsive, I'd buy it on Sunday. And that was the price of the world. (laughs) Because once things were open every day, that meant that things never stopped. And once things never stop, they keep on going. And in a culture that says all things must be increasing at all times, more money, more influence, more power, more growth, infinite growth up and to the right for all of time. I mean, suddenly we find ourselves in a very different situation. I don't like these new timekeepers at all, to be honest. They're always pushing me with these notifications. Telling me I need to go faster, go further, do more. Telling me to improve. Telling me to keep up. I don't want to keep up. I'm tired. I want a day off. You know, the church wasn't so bad, was it? The new timekeepers in Silicon Valley... The tech companies telling us when it is and what's going to happen next. I mean, they're ruthless. But the church, she just kind of told us to show up on Sunday for an hour. Not a big deal. We got seasons like Lent and the church said, don't eat meat, but you can have plenty of fish. That's not so bad. The holidays, the holy days... For times for everyone to rest and celebrate and come together in something bigger than us that unified us. I don't know. I don't think it was all that bad. Because these new companies, they're coming for all of our attention. They won't stop until they have every single moment of every single day marked out and bought and sold in advance. That's the mission. And so be sure to wish each other a happy Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. Sorry, when I say may the 4th be with you, you respond and with your spirit. Let's take that again. I've lived my whole life in the same city, same country, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And it's a good city, and it's a fine country, and it's what we call multicultural. We're very proud of being a country where many cultures come together, and there's something very beautiful about that. I've also wondered lately if multicultural might also be code for anti-religious. So hear me out on this. When I was a kid, we were already a bunch of godless heathens. (laughs) Nobody went to church. And that's fine. I'm not judging people for going or not going to church. 
but already religion was sort of out of the public eye. But when my father was a kid or my grandfather, we were as a culture, uh, uh, let's say little religious, little religious, just a little. Maybe you'd go downtown and there'd be 10 commandments posted, really large, 10 rules that we all agree are just fine. Or you might start the class uh, you know, in school, in the beginning of the day, have a little prayer for calm and peace, you know, just a little religious. But, you know, we would cover religion in the public eye. People would talk about religion. And then the multiculturalism started rising up. We realized, oh, there's temples around and Jewish people in this community. The Sikh community is in our country. And then we have this influx of Muslims. That never sounds good when you say it, but it's, I don't mean this in the way that Christians sometimes say this. I don't mean it like that at all. I just mean that we had a lot of Muslim people come into Canada. And what was our public response to all of this influx of very religious people? It was to just never talk about it again. We're just done talking about religion. We're not going to actually give an imam an opinion section in the paper to speak to moral good. We're not going to educate people on what these different religions are doing. We're just going to capitalize on every holy day. And then we'll just never talk about the fact that anyone's religious at all. I mean, how is it possible that our country's response to a bunch of very religious people coming into this culture was to just not be religious at all anymore. And, and, and what was it that took religion's place? Hmm. Interesting. It's like one of those old murder mysteries. The church lays dead on the floor, and someone in this room has done it. But who, who would have killed the church? Was it you? Economics. You've always been jealous of the church because people gave to her freely resources that you couldn't claim. But it might also be you. Entertainment. You've always been jealous of the church. Her art, her history, her stained glass windows. You want all that attention for yourselves. Hmm. Or perhaps it's you, my old adversary. Politics. No longer content to have the separation of church and state. Perhaps for you it had to be state and state. Perhaps that's why one of you drove a knife into her back. Yes, trouble is afoot. And we will solve this mystery. We will solve this mystery before the night is through. What is this accent I'm doing? <laughs> People always say you should be honest. We like honest art, honest writing, honest music. And so I'm going to attempt to be honest right now. My city looks like a war zone. It's, it's suffocating. The, 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 
there's a building down the street from this church that just has no facade, like no front. It just doesn't have a front, and no one can find the owner. And so the sidewalk has just been closed down with a bombed out building for a year. And there are people everywhere that don't have a house. And it's getting a little wild. People are smoking crack on the street like it's cigarettes. And I'm walking with my children just trying to figure out, like, how do you even begin to talk about the systemic failure that is our housing crisis? Everyone I know is feeling the weight of, of the cost of living. I had a woman in our congregation tell me that thinking about money makes her want to die. Thinking about money in this world makes her want to die, and people are dying. People are dying. We don't even know how to talk about it. We don't even know who they are. We don't even know when they've died. We're so disconnected, and that's just like part of it, the the being plugged in and being distracted. But these new tech companies, they have psychologists and sociologists on staff, and they're spending millions of dollars trying to figure out how to extract every single moment of attention from the psyche of every single person on earth. This is like evil bad guy stuff. They're summoning an artificial intelligence, you know, like a god. They're summoning a higher intelligence that they don't understand. And this is before we talk about global warming or before we talk about all the other issues that are pressing upon people today. Like, it's so endless, I can hardly begin. There's a war going on, probably more wars. There are children in mines harvesting something to get me an iPhone, and I don't even know what the thing is called that they're looking for. I am that detached from reality. And if there was one group, if there was one group that could take on all of these crises and offer some meaningful way through it, it would be the church. Like, we're already in every city. That's not going to last for much longer. People can show up and meet other people, flesh and blood people, and share burdens. People can seek transcendence together. Like, we actually already have the relationships, the networks, the resources. And maybe not for much longer, but we've got them for now, and we could do something. But this is the time that all of society decided to just take a break from God. Just out here playing patty cake with religion as if it didn't matter, as if it wasn't the other half, church and state. Like, like, of course religion's going to be one of the ways, maybe the only way through this crisis. It's always been there. Why did we think that we were better than it? But I don't want to rag on people that aren't Christian, aren't religious. You know, I don't want to pick on them because, you know, I don't, I, I don't, it's not my world, but I am religious. I'm a Christian. I was born into this. This is my inheritance, and there are other people who were born into this inheritance, and they're trading their inheritance for soup. Like, the church could do something about this, and the Christians, the Christian people, aren't going to church. Why? Why aren't you going to church? Like we just, if this was another time, if the stakes weren't so high, then you could take as much time as you need to feel this out. But the stakes are high and people are dying and this whole thing's coming apart at the seams. Just go to church, okay? Just go to church. Just, hey, are you even listening to me? Just go to church.
my wife is um, worried that I'm losing my joy. And so I think um, I think I'm done with all this honesty. <laughs> Just seeing too much. You know, when you live in a place like where I live and, and you see the things that we see at a time like this time, you know, you want to be brave. You want to be courageous. You want to lift up your head and, and, and ask questions and figure out what's going on. But the truth is, the truth is that everything I've learned has only led to more questions and every, uh, and every answer has ultimately failed to satisfy. And so maybe I'm not after that kind of knowing at all. Maybe there's a different kind of knowing and an experiential sort of knowing, a, a biblical sort of like, uh, you know, knowing. There's, there's, there's two ways. It's two ways to solve a problem. And maybe this problem can't be solved using the tools that I've been trying to use. And so I'm going to take a note from the psalmist and learn to keep my head down a little bit more, to take responsibility for what comes to me every day, uh, and to trust all that I don't see and can't see to someone else. Oh God, I am not proud. I have no heart. I have not concerned myself with great matters or with things that are too hard for me. But I still my soul and make it quiet like a child upon its mother's breast. My soul is quieted within me. O Israel, wait upon the Lord. From this time forth forth Not a lot of companies out there marketing with humility, like the virtue of humility. And it's interesting because we, we market using a lot of different virtues. You know, we talk about being courageous, being bold and brave, being kind, put it all over t-shirts, but nobody's making t-shirts that say, I'm wrong often. But maybe we should, you know? Why aren't these companies advertising using the, the virtue of humility? A lot of pride being advertised. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Now that I've said the P word, let me just be clear that when I'm talking about pride here, I'm not talking about capital P pride, like pride TM, or in Canada, TD. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about... The, the spirit of pride, the, the attitude 
of pride. I'm talking about what, what the scriptures refer to as the, the lifting of the neck, the raising of the horns, the thinking of yourself as greater than all the other animals. That is not popular. That is very popular right now. The humility part is not popular. This isn't complicated. You're all tracking with me on this one? Now, I do want to acknowledge that I understand why humility is on a bit of a timeout and, and lifting ourselves up and a bit of pride is in season. Because there are lots of people and groups of people who have felt oppressed, who have been pressed down upon by the structures of our day, by the systems in their own experiences and relationships. And when you've been pressed down for a long time and your head's been forced down, it can be such a gift to be told that you can raise up. You can find your natural form that you can come up from under that pressing. And maybe in that way, pride has its place. Not my favorite word for it, but maybe it has its place. It's like a sponge that's been squeezed for too long. You know, when you open it up, the sponge is going to have to move out for a while before it pops back in to its original shape. Maybe your life is like a, a sponge that's been squeezed, and, and now that it's been released, it's finding its proper form. But even when it pops out and the sponge finds its form, it's still not going to be, like, amazing. <laughs> it's, it's not going to be, like, the most awesome thing. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be good, a good, beautiful sponge, but a, a simple sponge. You know, a simple sponge at the end of the day. You're going to be born in a place around people, some of whom you like, some of whom you don't. You're going to have more things than some and less than others. And at the end, you're going to have a mix of emotions and feelings to work through in order to put together a meaningful, ordinary life. But humility, humility can help us enjoy that life. The word's linked, uh, it means like low to the ground. It's like the, the humus at the bottom of the tree or the hummus. I don't, I don't, I mostly read things on the internet, but the, the humus, the, the kind of soft part at the, at the base of the tree that, that is low to the ground, full of life, full of energy, that's what it means to be humble. It's to root ourselves, to get low. And, and when we do that together at a place like, I don't know, church, when we come together and, and we get low together, it just feels so good. It just feels so good to lower and humble and prostrate ourselves before the Lord. We just, we love you. It just feels so good to get low. I'm going to be honest with you. The hardest part of being in the church is undeniably the other people. And not even that they're particularly bad people. If I had to wager a guess, I'd say they're probably pretty good people overall. But they are still people. And people are a stumbling block for all sorts of reasons. You know, people say things that are stupid, offensive, ignorant. People wear things, symbols that set you off or make you nervous. People associate with other people that you wouldn't associate with. There's just a lot of space in the church to stumble over the other people who are also trying to humbly seek God. It's, it's kind of messy, but also maybe by design. 
because there's something so cool that to, to enter into this sort of community, to be in the church requires you to forgive people for just the petty crap that people do. And I think there's something beautiful there, you know, that you're going to have to learn to let things go. You're going to have to learn to forgive as you've been forgiven. You're going to have to learn to entrust others to God because they are products of their time, place, culture, surrounding, just like you are of yours and I am of mine. There's a real power to learning to hold each other in that sort of gift, that grace, that free current of forgiveness that can flow between one person and another when we're together in actual relationship. And that's the whole point is that, well, Jesus tells us that there's a constant source of love always flowing to us from God constantly there for us, whether we have done right or done wrong, whether we are guilty or innocent, the love continues to flow. But that forgiveness that comes to us is meant to flow through us. And if we haven't practiced forgiveness, we may have a hard time recognizing it in ourselves. Maybe when I, I talk about forgiveness, you feel a sort of gut reaction that you don't want to forgive because, because it might lead to more pain. And we should be clear that forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. We can forgive someone to free ourselves, to set them free, to allow God to take care of the situation. But that doesn't mean that we need to reconcile. And, and forgiving the church or the people that have harmed us in the church does not mean that we will go and be a part of that congregation again. You know, this is all much more nuanced, but there is a fundamental reality to forgiveness. That if it's not passing through us, it backs up, it, it grows, I don't know, moldy? I, what's a river like when it gets blocked? It's like a swamp, you know? We just get a swamp inside of us and we've got to sort of cut a new canal. I don't know anything about water. You know, I'm just trying to work with the metaphor. We're a conduit for an energy that doesn't come from us. And if we're struggling then to receive that love, that forgiveness, if we're struggling to live as if that's true for us, then maybe one way we can kickstart it is to practice forgiving someone else. And maybe when I say that, there's someone who comes to mind. Someone who you need to forgive just to be able to receive forgiveness again yourself. Someone you need to extend grace to because you need to receive grace. Someone who doesn't know what they're doing just like you and I have so often not known what we are doing. Father, have mercy. And that might sound a little intimidating. You know, forgiveness is intense, and, and sometimes we've got to work our way up to those big forgivenesses. But if you're looking for a place to practice it, I'm not worried about the future of the church. Not because things are going to go particularly well from like a worldly point of view, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about the future of the church, capital C, the, the mystic one, because I have just gotten a taste over the last few years of this, this way of, you know, what the church is really about, this humility, 
and grace and mercy and hope. And it, it is so good. It is so delicious. It is the only thing that's going to keep me getting up in the morning and <laughs> living another day because it's just, it makes life so good. And then it manifests goodness in life. And there will always be people who give themselves to that sort of project. I'll be honest, I don't know if there will be a church in 50 years from now, but I am positive there will be a church in 100 years from now. And I think if we could see that church, we would be very, very jealous of it. But that's, that's what we're doing. Everything we do now should be thinking about that church because things like this, this movement, things this old and this wise, they have a way of re-manifesting. But if you're looking for something now to help you get through the day, to help you make sense of your life, to help you find some hope and connection, you really should. You should go to church. You could. You could go to church. And I have learned that you can't yell at people to go to church. It's everyone's own journey. But you, you could. There's probably one in your neighborhood, probably one in your town. I bet they're meeting this Sunday, and you could go. And even if that one didn't go well, you could go next Sunday. It's every Sunday, and it's free. It's free. I mean, how good can it get? This is a gift, and it's one that I think is ready to be reclaimed. So go to church, or to temple or mosque or the longhouse, like whatever it is for you, sure, go seek God in a way that makes sense for you and your culture and community. But if you don't have anything else going on, you could always try church. And maybe if enough of us rally soon enough and give our energy to this inheritance, maybe we can preserve a few more of these spaces that mean so much and these practices that have shaped us for so long. And speaking of practices, uh, I need to wrap this up because morning prayer starts in uh, less than half an hour and uh, that's what I'm supposed to give my attention to now. And I am uh, appreciative, thank you so much for your attention. I, I really sincerely mean that. Thank you for watching. Grace and peace.